The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Kevin uh, is a graduate from Notre Dame and now working from Hinman Consulting Engineers and uh, this is also a summary of his uh, dissertation topic. So with that. Thank you Dr. Jensen. Thank you everybody for being here this afternoon. Uh, so this work like she said was done while I was at the University of Notre Dame uh, doing my PhD studies under my advisor Dr. Yaya Karama. And we're looking at the out of plane failure of full scale RC bearing walls subjected to one side fire exposure. The reason we're interested in uh, reinforced concrete bearing walls is because when they're used in the structural system, they carry a large amount of the gravity load of the building. So their failure under extreme events could be catastrophic for the overall building. They're also typically susceptible to compartment style fires. If they enclose some kind of a stairwell or an elevator shaft opening, uh, the typical fire is only going to be from one side um, if the fire started inside of a room. Uh, so Having that type of fire can create large thermal gradients through the thickness of the wall and also lead to unsymmetrical degradation of the concrete and steel, uh, similar to what Dr. Kodor was just talking about. So this would only happen on one side of the wall, not both. So considering all of this, uh, it can lead to out of plane instability under fire, which is usually not considered for uh, full scale bearing walls. So the project had three main objectives. The first was to experimentally investigate the out of plane thermal mechanical behavior of seven full scale RC bearing walls. We did that by evaluating the effect of geometric material reinforcement and loading parameters. And at the end, develop a rational predictive fire resistant structural design procedure. So this schematic here shows the overall test setup uh, that I use. I'm going to go through each individual part separately. Uh, the one thing I want to note first is the wall specimen here actually forms the back of the furnace. So unlike other furnace tests where you put the whole specimen that you're testing inside the furnace and you let it go, we're actually bringing the furnace to the test specimen and then we just seal it along the edge of the test specimen right here. So I'm going to start with the test specimen itself. Uh, so the schematic here on the left just kind of shows a general full length bearing wall um, and we've got multiple floor levels that you'd see in a typical building. We weren't able to test the full length bearing wall in our lab uh, just from space and capacity issues, but we wanted to realistically look at the different reinforcing um, designs that you would see on a full length bearing wall. So the first region we're interested in is the boundary region. Uh, this is where the actual opening for the stairwell door or the elevator shaft would be. You're going to have more longitudinal reinforcement and you're going to have transverse uh, ties in there for confinement purposes. The second region would be the web, the middle part of it. Um, you're going to have one or two mats of horizontal and vertical rebar typically depending on the thickness of the wall, but you usually don't need the transverse rebar because there's no confinement issues at the middle of the wall. So we want to look at both of these. Uh, so through our seven specimens, we incorporated these designs. So for specimens one through three, uh, we, we made them 380 millimeters thick, roughly three meters tall, and roughly a meter length, basically sliced out of a full length wall. So the first two, uh, we utilized the boundary region detailing at the top there. So we had those closely spaced longitudinal and the transverse ties. And then for specimen three, we did a straight web region where you only had the two mats of horizontal and vertical rebar. For specimens four and five, we want to look at what would happen you had a wall on the exterior of a building. Um, so now all of a sudden you'd have an eccentric load uh, from, the, from the slab and the rest of the building on top of it. So we reduce the thickness from the heated surface, uh, assuming that the fire would still happen within the building and not outside. Uh, so this creates an eccentric axial load that would be present during the entire experiment. Um, specimen four was 254 millimeters thick and specimen five was 305 millimeters thick, both boundary level detailing. The final two specimens, we reduced the thickness of the wall on both sides of the fire, so we returned to that concentric axial load that we had done for specimens one through three. But we made the thickness 203 millimeters, you can see here. Um, that goes below the 254 millimeter trigger in ACI 318 um, that requires two mats of horizontal and vertical rebar. Uh, so we only have the one mat there right at the mid thickness. So the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the final two specimens, six and seven. So the actual furnace consisted of two parts. You have the first part here, which is the actual controller, and then you have the furnace itself. 
So the controller is skid mounted, skid mounted, so you could move it anywhere in the in the in our laboratory uh, very easily. There was flexible hoses that connected it to the actual furnace, uh, so it had a lot of flexibility for future projects. Take this part here actually takes the natural gas and the combustion air in, and then this is where we control the fire. So we can do ASTM, we can do ISO, we can do any kind of standard time temperature curve you could come up with um, to the limits of the furnace. So this is where we control everything, and the furnace itself. Um, has a flat flame burner to uh, make it as uniform as possible, the heating on the surface of the wall. Then there's also a series of viewports going around the, the perimeter of the furnace chamber so we can look at the heated surface um, and capture small in or see what's actually going on during the fire. The inside of the furnace is pretty standard. You have your insulation. We have an array of nine ASTM U19 thermocouples uh, and then a high limit control thermocouple for safety purposes. So because the furnace is actually brought to the specimen and we're not putting the specimen inside a large furnace, we were able to keep all of our loading uh, systems outside of the furnace. So for the axial loading at the top, we were able just to use standard hydraulic jacks. Uh, we reacted against a very large reaction beam that's tied to the strong floor of the lab. Um, it's actually tied to a steel rocker system, so that way as the wall moves in the out-of-plane direction, the axial load can also move in the out-of-plane direction, and we can minimize P-delta effects on the wall. The... Uh, Either lateral, lateral load or lateral restraint, depending on the test we did, was accomplished through a large lateral actuator. So we built the reaction frame on one side of the wall and then the top of the test specimen on the other side. Um, both sides of the lateral actuator are pinned, so this way it allows axial displacement of the wall, rotation of the top of the wall, and then we control the lateral displacement of the wall. So for data collection, uh, we recorded both the axial and out-of-plane lateral displacement along the height of the wall, the out-of-plane rotation of the wall, we had strain gauges to measure the axial strain on the vertical rebar, um, both high and low temperature strain gauges in select specimens. Uh, the load, both ad lateral and axial load. Uh, we were able to measure the internal wall temperatures using embedded thermocouples that I cast directly into the concrete while I was uh, constructing the walls. And because the furnace is brought to the specimen, we now have open surfaces around. So we have two basically slice cut surfaces along the full length, and then we have the unheated surface that are completely open and they're not enclosed inside the fire. So we're able to use three different advanced monitoring systems. Um, the first is the FLIR thermal imaging camera. So this picture here actually shows that slice cut, that thickness part. So this would be the 380 millimeter thickness part. And you can see the thermal gradients going through the wall during the fire. The second is a three-dimensional digital image correlation measurement. So we painted that slice cut surface of the wall here white. And then we just drew a random uh, black pattern using Sharpies. And then the two cameras can basically follow this grid pattern throughout the entire test. Um, and result, and actually get us displacements, but then we can take those displacements and calculate rotations and also strain. So right here is a representative full field strain map that we were able to get from those cameras throughout the entire fire. We also investigated the use of a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging probe. Uh, we noticed in the earlier test that there's lots of water that was escaping the walls through all the unheated surfaces, and we wanted to try to capture that moisture propagation through the wall. Uh, so we kind of investigated the use of this on the unheated surface here. That's a very strong magnet and it can kind of can capture the moisture coming out. So the actual experiments for specimen six and seven. So specimen six was a normal strength concrete specimen, reached 49 megapascals of the day of testing. For specimen seven, we made a high strength concrete specimen, so it reached 123 megapascals. For both, we applied the maximum axial load that we could in our lab, uh, which was 2,400 kilonewtons. Uh, this was just the capacity of the tie downs onto our strong floor. We then um, kept these restrained at the top of the wall in the out of plane direction. So we wanted to represent a rigid floor slab system. So essentially the rest of the building hasn't really been affected by the fire too much yet. And so it's actually restraining the wall from moving. Um, so we're keeping that fixed at the top, or not completely fixed, but fixed in the lateral direction. We then started the fire. For the purpose of this test, we followed the ASTM E119 fire. Um, you could, we could have applied any standard fire or any design fire, uh, but we had to fix something because the whole purpose was to model this afterwards and try to uh, be able to do other types of walls. So we just needed to come up with something that was more uniform that people could, could replicate. So the plot on the top right is actually the axial load of all seven specimens. So we're focusing on six and seven, which you can see were very, very short fire durations compared to the other five. Uh, but all of them were right around that 2400 kilonewton applied axial load the entire test. On the bottom right uh, is the average furnace temperature um, from all these thermocouples that we have in here. Specimen one was the only one that we overshot, so for all the other specimens, we, we were very close to the ASTM curve. 
So damage progression, I'm just going to give you kind of a head up, heads up of what happened. So explosive spalling for both of these specimens occurred during the entire test. Um, it even extended all the way to the reinforcing steel, which is pretty typical for concrete. But in this case, the reinforcing steel was at the mid thickness of the wall. So we had uh, about 100 millimeters of concrete spalling on both of these tests. Cracking did allow some moisture to seep out. Um, we could see puddles of water all around the, um, the specimen on the floor. Uh, but at the end, the concrete spalling on one side of the wall and the unsymmetrical aggregation of the concrete led to catastrophic out-of-plane buckling failure, which I have a video of, which we'll get to. So, so these videos here are the actual concrete spalling that we experienced. So the video on the left, I sped up 400 times, so that way you could see the spalling over the entire viewport. So this is just one viewport of our furnace that I put a camera on. Um, and so I only went as long as the cover spalled. Spalling kept going after this, but it was very hard to see after the cover was gone because that smooth surface is no longer there. Um, so you can just see how quick, and um, this is only a minute 20 seconds of total duration, of total test duration that this video is showing. So the concrete cover spalled very quickly. The video on the right is slowed down to 5%, so the entire video is only 0.4 seconds of real fire duration. And I'm just showing how fast and how much energy is released during concrete spalling. You can barely pick up the slow-mo of the concrete spalling when I slow it down this much. So it's very fast. It happens very rapidly. Um, it pops off very quickly. And so I was, I was happy I was able to actually catch that. So those embedded thermocouples that I was talking about before, we had in, actually in the wall. So we had them um, going from the heated surface, and then we had layers going all the way to the unheated surface. So these plots here show everything against time. So what we were able to capture is the time at which spalling actually happened at all the different thicknesses. So the ones closest to the heated surface, you could see very, very clearly when spalling happened, because all the temperatures shot up right to the furnace control temperature that's shown there in black. As we go farther into the wall, so we're actually going towards the unheated surface, uh, you can see that the same thing is happening, but just at a later time. So now spalling is just continuing to occur going into the wall. This is already the mid-thickness, so you can see after 30 minutes we've already had spalling that's reached at at least one point in the heated surface has reached to the mid-thickness of the wall. And then the, un the cold face is also starting to now increase in temperature. I've taken these and I've now plotted them against uh, the thickness of the wall. So the heated surface is over here, the unheated surface is over here, and this black line is the furnace control temperature at each of these times. Uh, so this is showing that actual thermal gradient. So at 10 minutes the concrete's doing a great job, it's providing a nice insulation like it's supposed to. By 20 minutes, we've already got spalling uh, at multiple part places on the heated surface. By 30, the whole heated surface is gone. We're now moving into the next um, about what, 50 millimeters in. Now we're already at 100 millimeters in, and the temperatures just keep going up from there. So as spalling happens, obviously the fire is now propagating farther and farther in. So the lateral load that developed, so we had that lateral actuator that was there, restraining the out-of-plane movement of the wall during the entire test. So in order to restrain the movement, uh, load developed within the actuator. So at the very beginning, the heated surface, everything was still there. Spalling hadn't occurred yet, and so the concrete, it wants to elongate. And so it, it's pushing on the actuator, which has to go into compression to keep the wall where it's at. So we get some lateral load that develops for both specimens. However, as spalling happens and the, the degradation of the concrete only on the heated surface, the axial load is still applied at the exact same location. So an eccentric axial loading condition occurs only within the heated region, which eventually creates an overturning moment up at the top that wants to push the wall towards the furnace. So then for the next part of the test, the actuator unloads itself because it doesn't need to restrain as much. And then eventually it actually needs to pull the wall up because the wall wants to completely fall over onto the furnace due to this eccentric axial load that developed. So the plots here on the left show the deflected shape. Uh, so the actual lateral displacement here and then the wall height. Uh, so this is before, we've already applied the axial load, but we have not applied any kind of fire yet. And then the pictures are at the exact same time. Um, you can tell that there's about four millimeters of deflection at the top of the wall that was not intended. That's just simply from construction and, you know, putting all the pieces together. We had some unintended eccentric um, loading, but it's still only four millimeters over a three meter height wall. So it's still very small. Uh, 10 minutes and then 20 minutes, you can see that the wall has started to move a little bit towards the furnace. Um, which is typical, the wall is trying to expand, so the, the actuator is pushing it, so it's moving a little bit towards the furnace. By 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you can see the mid-height of the wall is starting to form uh, a nice little uh, buckling mechanism there. And by 46 minutes, the wall is done. Um, it's not that much displacement, and if you were looking at the pictures, you can't visually see this. We couldn't visually see that it was gonna happen. Um, we didn't know this was gonna fail this suddenly. Um, people were running down from all different parts of the lab. <laughs> um, 
So there's a very large shear crack that developed at the base. There's a huge temperature difference between the heated surface and then the foundation because, um, you know, it's, it's, much th you know, it's a much thicker area down in the foundation part. Um, the biggest thing to take away from this is if you look in the ACI 216, uh, this thickness of wall should have a four-hour fire rating, four-plus-hour fire rating just from the thickness alone. Uh, and we're at 46 minutes, and we already had failure. So here's the cool video. It's cool now. It wasn't cool then, but it's really cool now. So it, very sudden, if we had volume, it, it was very loud, um, and it was an absolute mess to clean up. So, so the plot here on the top right is the uh, axial displacement of the top of the wall. So you can see the initial shortening from the axial load. You can see that expansion that occurred uh, from the initial thermal elongation. <clears throat> but then you can see at the end, very rapid shortening as the wall was approaching failure. Same thing with the lower displacement at the mid-height. Um, you had that small increase towards the fire and then a rapid decrease away from uh, the fire upon failure. So specimen seven, the high strength concrete specimen, um, did a much better job with those unintended eccentricities. We have almost nothing here. Um, the scale is still very small, but we have almost no out of plane displacement. So now at the beginning 20 minutes, you can really see the displacements going towards the furnace, which we expected. And the same thing, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, 70 minutes, we got a huge mechanism forming at the mid-height of the wall, <clears throat> 71 minutes, it's gone. Same failure, same shear crack is here. It's really hard to see, and it actually kind of got destroyed even more, but the same shear crack developed. Again, that table in ACI 216, it doesn't care what the concrete strength is. <clears throat> it's just the thickness of the wall, still be over a four-hour fire rating. <clears throat> so the <clears throat> axial displacement was the same way. You had the initial shortening, you had your expansion, then you had your rapid decrease upon failure. Same thing with the lower displacement, it moved towards the furnace, and then it moved rapidly away from the furnace. So this is an overview of all seven specimens that we tested. Specimens one through five had all kinds of cool stuff that happened, but none of them failed like specimens six and seven. Um, so all that's in the literature. You can email me. You'll see my email at the end. I have tons of data for all of these. These went for several more hours, and their uh, failure mechanisms were completely different. Primarily, they had longitudinal rebar on both surfaces of the wall, heated and unheated surface, and so that buckling failure wasn't going to occur in any of those. So we had other types of failure mechanisms. But for specimen six and seven, they had no transverse steel. They only had the one mat of horizontal and vertical rebar. Concrete strains varied, um, which means the normalized average applied axial stress on the walls also varied, but they were somewhat within the range of what most design professionals uh, told us at the time they kind of liked to hit. Uh, they both experienced lots of, exp or lots of spalling that went all the way to the mid-thickness of the wall. They both had that shear and buckling failure, and they both failed at a time significantly lower uh, than what the code allows. So in summary, experimentally tested seven full-scale RC barrel wells under fire. I only talked about two of them today. Um, we did this by designing and commissioning a portable compartment-style natural gas furnace. Some really important conclusions to take away. So spalling and unsymmetrical material degradation caused that eccentric axial loading condition to develop within the heated region. This means the wall is going to tend to curve towards the heated region with the heated surface in compression and the unheated surface in tension. So when you have walls that are less than 254 millimeters thick and you can get away with by code, maybe not for other loads, but by code, one mat of horizontal and vertical rebar, all of a sudden you have nothing there um, on the unheated surface to carry those tension forces that develop. So our design recommendation, of course, would be even when it's not required for other loads to include that double mat reinforcement on both the heated and the unheated surface. So when these full-scale bearing walls go out of plane during a fire, they still have rebar there to carry the load. Uh, I'd like to thank NSF for sponsoring this project, uh, the following professionals and companies for their support during the project. Thank all of you for being here. My email is right there if you have any questions or want more information. <clears throat>